Eduardo is currently working on an open educational resource textbook for Portuguese called Bate Papo, an introduction to Portuguese. So without further ado, I give Eduardo the floor. Thank you very much, Simone. Thank you for referring me to this talk. Thank you all for participating this later on in the quarter. I know it's quite an accomplishment to be online these days, right? Uh, after all, all of our classes. So I'm gonna share the screen here and I'll follow the PowerPoint presentation. I'll probably keep this uh, somewhat short uh, just to give us more time for a Q&A at the end. So, you know, the talk is about developing an open and inclusionary language textbook for Portuguese. I think some of the ideas here, most of them can be applied to other languages as well. And I would be curious to hear your opinions and suggestions as, as we talk at the end. Um, I did publish an article about this textbook and I'm glad to share with you. There are other articles in the book as well about open access material. It came out in 2019 in a book called New Case Studies of Openness in and Beyond the Language Classroom. And I co-wrote that with a colleague from UPenn, Carlos Pio, who is from Portugal. I'm originally from Brazil and we both shared ideas about this, op this open textbook. So here's you know, a picture of the, the book about the case studies. So the context of this project, the first thing that one of the reasons for me to, to think of creating an open textbook is because in Portuguese, we just don't have a lot of materials available. And, um, you know, I was looking online for things and beyond Duolingo and, and which I, I actually like it, but other sources that I could find, um, I could not find much of a textbook that they could use in the classroom that would be open um, and free of charge. The other reason was the cost of language textbooks. So in a lot of the Portuguese classes that I teach, I have students that come from minority groups and spending $150 in a textbook uh, is an issue for a lot of them. So I decided, I thought that it would be better to have something that was free of cost or with, with a very reduced cost, maybe $20, $30 for the textbook. And I couldn't find that. The other reason as well was that the textbooks that I was used to, to have in our classes, they followed a top-down approach in, this, in the writing process in the sense that the language in the textbook, you could see that it represented the language of a high middle class, highly educated person. And a lot of the times didn't have um, like expressions that people use nowadays that are more, you know, among people that are younger. And, and that was on one of the reasons as well. So having that in mind, you know, my idea was to go to Brazil. I want the book to be on Brazilian Portuguese and interview a few people from different background and based on their dialogues, or on the, my conversations with them and observations, then I would create the material. So the material would be generated from the dialogues among people in Brazil. So the intended outcomes was to present everyday Portuguese language, um, which can be a challenge. I realized very early on that when I created the dialogues, let's say a dialogue in, uh, in a grocery store, a dialogue in a restaurant, sometimes things that I wrote wasn't, wasn't necessarily how people actually speak in Brazil. Um, and that's for many reasons. One of them is that I have been in the US for a long, long time, almost 20 years. The other reason is that I just don't speak like someone that works in a restaurant speaks. And I don't mean that in a bad way or a good way. It's just, we have different registers 
And when I try to replicate some other people's registers, a lot of the times I get it wrong too. Um, another intended outcome was to be inclusive, as I mentioned before, and the inclusivity would be represented through gender identifications, uh, race, and also the voice of LGBTQI people. Um, and my main reason of thinking for that was that um, I, I am gay and I thought, you know, I haven't seen um, that in textbooks other than being just like something that it's presented on a side note. And I wanted, you know, this to be part of the narrative as well, not just a curiosity. Um, related to race, this was before Black Lives Matter, but um, and pre-COVID when I started working on this book, I just thought that, um, you know, Brazil is, is a country that has, it's such a mixed race country, like according to the last census, 53% of, of Brazilians are of mixed race, meaning black or pardo as we categorize. And our textbooks, they are, a lot of the times they're very white. And, and that was a, a thing I wanted to reason with and get the opinions of colleagues in Brazil who are black that could help me in, in the construction of the material. So the bottom up approach came from that writing process when I would go to the country. And again, this was pre COVID. So, you know, life was much easier. I could just travel and be in Brazil for a summer and go to the country, record dialogues, talk to people, and then based on that, start constructing the textbook. So here is where the textbook is hosted, is with the University of Washington. They have a platform called Press Books, um, and, and I chose to use the Creative Commons. So it's just CC BY, I use the simplest one. So anyone can have access to the material, they can change, they can modify the material, um, they can use as is, um, it can be sold in a, in, in a copy center, that there are no restrictions on that, as long as you say where the material is coming from. Here is a sample of a dialogue, and I know that most of you don't speak Portuguese, but you can see how people are reacting. It's not a professionally done dialogue. It was recorded at the University of the State of Sao Paulo. And you can see this person is looking at the camera, but overall the language is there. And I just wanted to give you a sample of what I'm talking about. Where do you live? I live in a republic. How many people? I live with eight. Eight? Nossa. And you? Eu moro em kitnet. Sozinha? Sozinha. Ah, tá. E Eu você? moro numa república. Ah, também? Tem Sim. bastante gente? São cinco. Cinco? Uh -huh. Ah, então menos que eu, né? É. So it's, it's just 19 seconds. And that was one thing I wanted to do, to get very short clips. Because I thought that what I could find online was most of the time, like, longer clips. And for a language class, a minute, it's a lot of language and it's very hard to process at the lower levels. So on, from this dialogue, I didn't ask them to do anything rehearsed. I just asked them to talk about where they lived. Just, you know, ask questions about where you live between the three of you. And then since it was not rehearsed, a lot of natural language came up. So for example, they use contractions as numa, that's in the, they just contract instead of saying in uma. Um, they use a lot of expressions like a, ah, ta, you know, marking surprise or ne, like the, the question tag here that's very common in, in Brazilian Portuguese or the hesitation of eh, eh, or confirmation. Um, so things that I would not necessarily put in a dialogue myself. And then the vocabulary that came up, 
like the word kitchenette, that means studio, like coming from English, the word kitchen. Um, that is something I would not even think about. You know, I wouldn't think about that word. Um, and Republica as a dorm, that's something we, um, most people know in Brazilian Portuguese. So there is a range of, of sentences. And you can see that sometimes the answers are not like a complete answer. Like I live with eight people or you live with eight people. They say eight, wow. So you have the wow here with nossa. Um, and it's just full of everyday language that I then used in the textbook. Here is an example of the inclusive representation that I was mentioning before. Um, I made sure that the textbook, and it's something I'm still working on, you know, it's a working on progress, but it has uh, iconic people from Brazil. Uh, this is a reporter, Gloria Maria, and also from other parts of the Portuguese speaking world, like Am Amilcar Cabral from Guinea Bissau. And I wanted the book to have a range of races as well, not just, you know, um, iconic actors and people from Brazil who are um, a lot of the times are white people. I wanted to, to have a range. And here is a symbol of the LGBTQ movement, uh, which is a trans woman. And even the language here, like when I started writing the textbook, I wrote transsexual. And then I had someone pointing out to me and saying, oh, if you say mulher trans, a trans woman, it's much more 21st century, right? Um, and, and that's part of the being open and everybody that reads the textbook can give me suggestions. And it's very fast for me to go in the textbook and, and change when I think it's appropriate. So it takes a few minutes only. For the, for the bottom-up approach, we had a lot of students um, participating in two universities, at the, the University from the state of Sao Paulo and also from the state of Minas. Here's a list of the students and I just listed them as contributors to, to the textbook. But then in Seattle, I also had Brazilian students recording parts of the textbook. It's like the directions in, in the exercises, some of the readings are recorded. And I was able to get a variety of accents as well in the textbook. And for people who are familiarized with Brazil, if you speak, if you're from Rio, there is one very distinct accent. If you're from Sao Paulo, there is another very distinct accent and from the Northeast and so on. So that, that was important as well. And other group of people that I did pre-COVID and I hope to go back and continue that in the future are people that work in different professions. So I recorded one waiter awaiting a table in a restaurant. Uh, I wanna record in the future, someone getting a haircut in a hair salon, buying bread in a padaria, like a bakery in Brazil. I wanna record like everyday, like snapshots of everyday life in Brazil in, in the future as well. Some of the details um, in the organization of a textbook like this are the Creative Commons license. It's a decision you have to make right in the beginning if you wanna make it more restrictive or not. As I mentioned before, I chose to, to go with the less restrictive option. I just kept my name because uh, for professional reasons, you know, it's good to have a publication, but even that I was questioning in the beginning, but the librarians at my university encouraged me to keep my name on it because they, they thought it would be important. Um, there is the, a workbook that come along with the textbook. So I created the workbook on Canvas and it's now being created as well on Blackboard by the University of Southern California. And the idea of having a workbook is just that we are used with textbooks that um, 
come with a workbook so we can grade students and have a number attached to their effort in learning the language. So I decided to do that built on Canvas directly. The grammar explanations, I, I didn't go into depth in grammar explanations for this textbook. My idea was to create a series of very interactive activities for the classroom based on my experience. Um, I do teach Portuguese every day. You know, I, we have our classes Monday through Friday for 50 minutes. And, and that experience from years and years of teaching, and I know a lot of people here can relate to that we end up adapting a lot of activities in the textbook so it works better for us in the classroom. So I just wanted to have a textbook that already, had it, already have the activities that you can just open the material and do it, right? I also work with TAs that don't have a lot of experience teaching Portuguese language classes and I want them to be able to open that guide and just follow through. So for the grammar explanations, we use another open textbook. It's Portuguese para principiantes from University of Wisconsin. And I think there is a huge advantage when you are doing everything open and available. And that's one of them that you can use other material as well to complement what you are doing. And I also included podcasts from Lingua da Gente. Um, and those podcasts are developed by Corel. Um, it's missing an R here. It's the Center for Open Educational Resources and Language Learning from the University of Texas at Austin. And I would encourage you to visit their website. They have several materials in different languages that are available online. So I use their podcasts in the text as well. And I'm still implementing them more and more. Here is an example of the workbook on Canvas. So the question was about what they do on the weekends, if they like to, what they normally do. And then this person is saying, I like to exercise and watch horror movies. Gosto de fazer exercício físico, assistir filmes de terror. And then I encourage them to use expressions that came from the textbook, from the dialogue. So this one saying, wow, I also like to work out and watch horror movies. I mean, she committed a mistake here. Também gosta, também gosta de malhar. And then the next person is going, cool, legal. I also like horror movies. It seems to be a class that likes horror movies. But this was a part of the workbook when I created, I used the discussion board. From the first week of the class, when the students would then start a conversation among themselves outside the classroom. And turns out that it worked really well now during the pandemic because they got to know each other a little bit better. Um, and here's just a continuation of the conversation, but you can see that they are doing an app, making an effort to use the expressions like massa, que legal, that are everyday expressions in Brazilian Portuguese. And then this is a more traditional type of exercise that it's, it receives a grade from the system. Um, here is just asking students to use short answers. So do you have lunch at home? Yes, I do. I have lunch at home or I don't. And then they just complete, you know, write their answers and the system will give the points. It is not perfect, like in the sense that if, if a student makes a mistake with an accent, let's say they don't put the, this accent here, um, the system will just consider this answer wrong and take two and a half points. So Canvas is not yet there, at least not in my institution, to, um, to grade differently, like you know, if it's missing an accent. But overall, it works well, and I give students Three, I think three or four possibilities to, to retake the exam as well. Not the exam, the exercise. Here's another one that's 
the typical fill in the blank. They have the list of verbs. They read the dialogue and start plugging in the verbs, but they have to conjugate them. So it becomes a little bit harder to have to understand the context. And here is the cover of the textbook and the link. Um, I will put that on the chat so we can, um, so you can have access to it and see uh, what I did there. But you know, in a short conclusion, I'm happy to talk to you in more extension about what I did. I think the Q&A session will be more interesting than just having me talk by myself here. Um, but, you know, this textbook is intended to be more representative of several social linguistic backgrounds uh, presenting language that's inclusive. Um, and the goal is also to offer quality material, instructional material that's accessible online and free of charges. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, it is a work in progress in the sense that um, I still have a lot to go back and do it, but I was able to write eight units for the textbook. I'm planning to write another two. And as any textbook, you know, I think the instructor will use, adapt things to his or her um, ways of teaching as well. But overall, I, I'm very proud of it. And I think it does represent everyday Portuguese language uh, in Brazil, uh, which was something that I didn't see on, on a lot of the textbooks before. There's some acknowledgments really fast, but you know, I, get, I got uh, from the University of Washington Libraries, I, I got an award to pay someone to help me to design the textbook. Also the Center for Global Studies in my institution helped a little bit and the Language Learning Center, just like this Language Learning Center uh, was fundamental in helping me with ideas for the textbook. The Center for Latin American Studies at the University of Florida as well. And Corel uh, was a great source for me. We, I've talked to them several times about the idea of the textbook and more than anything, I would say that colleagues in other institutions and students, they were also a great help because I was able to get their feedback as I was developing the pilot material. And through focus groups and conversations in class, I was able to then go back and adapt things in the textbook uh, to be more useful for the students as well. So it was kind of, um, collaborative process in that sense. Um, I did choose to have myself as the author, as I said before, because I did think that at some point, someone has to call the shots and decide, you know, what you're gonna do? Like, are you using this dialogue or that dialogue? And I could have done that with other people, but I didn't find anybody that was that inclined to create an open textbook. <laughs> at least not with me, <laughs> but um, so I just took on the theme on my own in that sense. But um, I would say if anybody here is interested in working with OERs and creating maybe a guide or a textbook or maybe a module for a class, you know, it doesn't have to be a whole textbook. I would definitely encourage, I think this has been um, for me, uh, something that has given me a back a lot. Uh, I have talked about this book so many times in so many places by now, but it has given back to me also in the sense of rethinking about my teaching practices, um, trying to connect that with research on, on second language acquisition as well. Um, try to connect that as well with the auto proficiency guidelines that are part of the ACTFO guidelines. I'm a tester with ACTFO for Portuguese, and, and I also had that in the back of my mind, you know, how can I create here a material that it's really building up on skills, scaffolding, and 
um, preparing students to advance on the level proficiency as they keep going on with the teaching material. Um, another aspect is to close up that for me was important is that I felt that I, I'm in the classroom every day and I've seen, and I don't mean that as an offense for anybody, but I've seen a lot of, I've used textbooks with people that sometimes I read the, the activities. I'm like, this is not someone who is in the classroom because it, the activities work really well on paper. But when you are in practice doing with students, it just doesn't always work out well. So um, I started questioning, you know, who is writing these textbooks? Like, are they in the classroom most of the time? And then I figure out that they are not. Like the ones that I know from, I don't I can't say much because then I'll give names away. But from other language groups that I talk to, um, I would I realized they just taught the class once, you know, and then they wrote the textbook and revised it, but then they never taught the class again, uh, beginning level class. And there is something about being in class with your students every day that does give you the knowledge of how things work in practice. And, and that's something you cannot teach. You have to go through, like you have to do it in order to know, right? So finish up on that note. Um, and then I would like to hear from you and, and maybe from Simone as well. And, and I'm hoping we can have a nice conversation um, from here on. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Eduardo. This was really um, interesting, very fascinating. I think a lot of us here can um, relate to the fact that the, there simply aren't many materials in our languages mm -hmm. or that the materials that do exist are very expensive, very outdated, um, and really don't speak to the interests of students. And, and I think I really like the focus on um, conversational actual spoken language because ultimately, most of our students want to be able to travel abroad and use the language. And I think sometimes pre-existing textbook materials really don't support that skill enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And with Portuguese and Simone knows that better than most of us here, I guess. The, we do have a lot of shortcuts when you're speaking the language. So uh, for instance, we don't use object pronouns uh, very much, we just do omission. So you say, instead of saying, I like it, we just don't use the it, we just say, I like, right? Um, and when you try to explain that in a first year language textbook, the ob direct object pronouns, they're just so complicated mm -hmm. and take so much time. And people don't use it most of the time, unless if you are highly educated or if you're writing, um, and writing for academic purposes too. So I just made choices that in my mind, it made a lot of sense. This is not something we use. I'm not gonna teach it. I'm just gonna mm -hmm. put a podcast from Corel that's talking about the omission of direct object pronouns. And that was it. So that's, that's my teaching on it. It's like a 15 minute podcast. Um, some people hear that and they just jump like this, right? It, it gets, they get offended like that. I don't know why, but a lot of people I know that are language teachers, they do feel that, you know, they are the guardians of the Portuguese language. And I don't, I don't have the same uh, feeling to it. So uh, I'm much more about teaching what people actually use it on every day. And then as you progress, I think there is a, a space for that as you are in a second, third, fourth mm -hmm. language class, then you're gonna learn more of those nuances, but maybe not in the first you know, semester, second semester in a language class. Well, it's more like a process of first language acquisition, right? Yeah. I mean, we don't learn the rules of our first language first, right? We, we are exposed to language in use and that's how we pick it up so and we know that it's effective because we all somewhat mastered our first languages 
and especially when it's a rule of something that you actually don't use mm -hmm. you know yeah. so what's the point now you know how to use you know the rule you might know how to use it but you go to brazil and you're the one of the only ones mm -hmm. using that structure because people around you are not doing it yeah yeah so i, I don't see it so I actually do have one other question real quick before um, we open the floor here to everybody else. Um, well, one comment and one question, I guess. The video example that you shared, I really liked the fact that it was unscripted and that it was, you know, it seemed natural. I mean, you could hear like children screaming in the background at first, right? And I think oftentimes when we produce materials, even like during the last 12 months, during the last, you know, since, since spring of 2020, I know a lot of our my colleagues here have been um, revamping their own materials and oftentimes spending a lot of time editing videos and editing audio. Mm -hmm. um, and I like this more um, natural real life approach because again, you know, when you use language, mm -hmm. you will never use it in a in a recording studio. So mm -hmm. I think it behooves us as a you know, as a profession to be more realistic about how we present the language and also how we um, just have our students interact with that. And there is one thing about the script, the scripted dialogues too, that sometimes people want to introduce their uh, grammar points mm -hmm. and it's so forced into the dialogue that becomes a dialogue that nobody would ever have. Mm -hmm. You know, it just has all I don't know, no. all the contractions that existed in the Portuguese <laughs> language in five, six sentences. And you read that and you're like, this doesn't even feel like a natural dialogue. Mm -hmm. So I did not want to have that. I, I wanted to stop myself from doing that. And at the same time, yes, I do want to, you know, I don't want to start with past tense in the first chapter because I do think it would be counterproductive. So some of the dialogues when people are speaking the past a lot, I thought, okay, those dialogues, I will use them later on in another lesson, but not in the first lesson, right? Um, but I kept myself away from trying to be too prescriptive mm -hmm. and say, no, you have to include X, Y, Z. No, I didn't do that. And I thought it turned out well, as long as they are short, like 20 seconds, 15 seconds. I found that up to 30 seconds, it's okay for lower levels. Ideally like 20 seconds. If the person speaks too fast, it might be, you know, I had some dialogues that I'm, I thought they were great, but you, it was really hard to understand, to follow one of the speakers because it was too fast. And that, that one, at some point I just removed it because I was using class and everybody was just struggling mm -hmm. so much. I'm like, yeah, this is not really working. So again, you know, we try with the students, it doesn't work. Take a step back and modify it. Um, so Chris put a question here in chat as a follow-up. Um, can you provide some more information on how the videos were actually recorded? Did, is that what you did when you went to Brazil? Yeah, so I got, I got a grant from $2,000 and I bought a camera, <laughs> you know, like a recording camera. And I don't know if that was the right decision, but it worked. And I brought a nice mic that like blocked the, the wind and stuff. But I'm not the most high tech person at all. And I was just recording those scenes and I did the editing of the videos on, on my Apple computer. And I'm like, okay, this is what I can do just to put the title and, you know, cut the end and the beginning and the end when you're just, so that was it, like very low tech in that sense. I, I now want to go back and record with my iPhone, you know, make sure I have like an iPhone that I can get like maybe I'm mic that I can hide somewhere because if you have a mic like mm -hmm. on the person it's better to capture the voice um, but then showing the mic it looks artificial too so I don't know how I'm gonna do that uh, but I wanted to try with uh, an iPhone I've tried with asking people in Brazil to record dialogues and send to me um, 
it was more difficult than I thought. Like when you ask people to record, some people, they just change the way they talk. <laughs> they become robots. I don't know why. It's just like you put a camera in front of them and they just speak differently. Um, so it, it takes a lot of trial and error. Like some of the dialogues, you just can't use it because they sound, the person. you can see that the person is not producing natural language. So those, I just didn't use it. I would say maybe I use like 30% of them. Sure, yeah. Did you run into any copyright issues? Like, are there any, you know, you showed us those three images of um, how you made sure to include diversity. I don't know if those yeah. particular three images of those people are included in the book. So what I did um, with people who are in the recordings, I had a, an image release from the University of Washington. I translated the image release to Portuguese because it, you know, it has to be in the language of the, that the person speaks, that they are signing. And then I patched, I had the English version and I just collected all this paperwork and having a file in my office. Um, for other images, I used unsplash.com a lot. Mm -hmm. The only problem with unsplash is that sometimes the images are too Americanized. Like, so mm -hmm. I don't, now when I wanna put a picture of a pound de queijo, like it is in Brazil, like a cheese bread that is, you know, in Brazil and not in Seattle, because they do look, I don't know, just the place around looks different, like the doors and the windows. I want it to look like you are in Brazil. So um, I'm planning on going back and taking pictures myself so I can use those. Um, I'm sure there are other ways of doing this that, you know, I just probably need some help. <laughs> I, it's missing also more images. I just didn't have the time to really, uh, and not even the resources to have like a cartoonist doing, you know, drawings or I thought that would be nice. Um, so I didn't get to that. It was really the images that I searched myself on any splash a lot of the times. Or Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. What questions do we have from the audience here? So I do have a couple of questions, Eduardo, and thank you for the very nice talk and for the work you're doing for Portuguese. Um, let me start with one and then I'll let everyone else ask questions and I'll come back at the end. But um, one of the things that caught my attention is your uh, preoccupation with the diglossia that Portuguese only has. And I completely agree with you. Um, it is one of the things you gave the example of the direct object pronouns, right? And it's one of the things I worry about all the time when I'm teaching introductory or intermediate is that some of the dialogues, they just feel completely unnatural for Brazilian Portuguese. But I also feel that because Portuguese deals with this incredible diglossia between written language and spoken language I have to keep reminding students so this is how you speak but you cannot write this way and in general here we have students who are very interested in both forms of the language and uh, expressing themselves orally but um, maybe surprisingly I don't think at FIU I had that many students who were very interested in writing, but surprisingly, we have a lot of students interested in writing. So I was wondering if you can, could tell us about, a little bit about how you juggle that in the book or how you go about this in your own classrooms or how you think about this diglossia and, um, and the material you use and then the way you teach. So I think, you know, because it is a first language textbook, um, I try to do the scaffolding in a sense that I just wanna introduce things that I think students can digest at, at that point. I've had students in a lower level Portuguese class that come with the idea that they'll be able to handle Portuguese at several levels and registers. And normally they are the ones that are less successful in the language because they just get so hung up on the grammar and, 
and rules that you know they can't really speak the language. So my idea with this textbook in particular was really teach you how to speak the language um, and simplify, not simplify, but just use language how it is spoken. And for Brazilian Portuguese, you know, another controversial point, uh, I've heard that from linguists and I kind of agree with them. It's almost like a Creole language in a lot of ways because Brazilian Portuguese is what it is because of the mix of African languages and indigenous languages. Um, and there is a lot of shortcuts that you know, in Portugal they don't necessarily do. But as we move up on a second year language class, then I start introducing, um, we read short stories, we, we read, um, a book for teenagers, and then we read a play, and, and then at some point you start reading the news, and then all these more sophisticated and nuances in the language start being introduced through texts of literature or the news or informational texts. So that's how I, I start expanding uh, what you have seen before or not seen before. And that expansion and recycling of language, I think it's key for a language program. And sometimes it gets lost. Like you think, oh, I introduced contractions, right? Of in the first chapter, I don't really have to talk to, to students again about this, <laughs> but they don't acquire, right? All the contractions because they saw in chapter one. So I heard that from other people that write language textbooks that one thing that misses a lot is recycling, you know, going yeah, back to points that you have introduced, expanding them. Mm -hmm. So that's why I divided the chapters in two parts. So it's like chapter 1A, 1B, because 1A introduces the first concept and then 1B expands a little bit on the vocab, but there are things there that even I think it's too much, you know, like lists of words that go on, on, and on. And like, who is going to memorize these 20 types of brads? You know, <laughs> like it's crazy. So I just tell students, you know, just memorize what you eat. Like that's one way of going, or what you definitely don't eat, right? If you don't eat that kind of brad. Um, but it's not my intention that they will memorize a whole list of words because I think, you know, it's out of context. Uh, it's just hard to do it. But yeah, I think there is a time and place for everything. That would be my short version answer. And sometimes we get, you know, it's easy to overwhelm students when you want to teach everything. Are there other questions from the audience? And people keep private messaging me that they have to leave. So they, they apologize for skipping out early here. Which language do you have represented here? So Simone is with Portuguese. There's probably Spanish, right? We have Spanish, yeah. Um, we have Korean. We had um, Japanese. We had Bengali. Um, we had Nepali. Okay. What language am I missing? If I'm if I'm missing your language, please chime in here. I think that may have some, it. some of the things you're talking about. It applies for all languages, right? The way that textbooks are organized and Absolutely. they're very traditional. With uh, yeah. you know, press books, they they just do in one way. Like you can you have to introduce this grammar point in chapter you know one or two. Um, but others that you know, people like Mary that teach Thai or um, Bengali and other languages that you just don't have as many mm -hmm. textbooks, then I think then we even have more in common in the sense that Portuguese is one of these languages that, you know, there is like one textbook that dominates the market mm -hmm. and everybody uses that textbook. And then at some point, another textbook comes along and that's what is defining the curriculum of a language class. Yep. When in fact, I don't think a, 
uh, language textbooks should be the curriculum. I understand why it is because, mm -hmm. you know, in practice, that's the easiest way out of this mess of teaching a language. But um, even when I was using a textbook that everybody used, I decided, I made decisions like I'm not teaching this, you know, these and these pages I'm not doing, uh, I'm not doing the past at the end of the first quarter and then putting students put that on a on an exam because students will just go nuts right it's so hard so i'm not going to do the past here um so i was thinking in terms of language proficiency as well uh that spectrum of going from a beginner all the way to a superior level great yeah mijong you have a question Yes. Um, hi, Eduardo. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your expertise on creating a um, more affordable and an open uh, textbook. Um, that is really inspiring me to think about um, um, creating the, um, the elementary level Korean uh, textbook um, in the future. Um, so we are using the textbook that is like dominant um, um, publisher and then um, those uh, dialogues and the textbook is rigid it's not natural mm -hmm. um, and um, but you know we are just relying on them and using have been using that but you know I realized that you know and, and then mostly they are um, the textbook dialogues are um, scraped by the my generation and older generation people so you know it's a very standard language but you know especially if they um, the students visit Korea and then they're going to meet with their um, younger generation and their communication and they will, they're gonna be um, difficult to understand each other because usually the younger generations are using the, like abbreviated, you know, phrases and the words. So you know, even even to me, like a, as a native speaker of Korean, I cannot understand what they are talking about. Sometimes I have to decode, uh, decode it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so um, probably um, the textbook dialogue doesn't need to be text. Right. So as you created like a um, video, I really like that. It's it was a conversation between. I mean, among three people, mm -hmm. I never we never had a dialogue like uh, among more than three. Mm -hmm. So it, it was always you know between two people and it's equally distributed. It's mm -hmm. a kind of a, like a robot, you know, mm -hmm. speaking. It yeah, was not same natural. Thing with Portuguese, yeah, same thing with the Portuguese textbook that I used. Long mm -hmm. answers. And then you get a student at the lower levels, they can handle three parts of a sentence. Mm -hmm. like, right, they, they forget. Yeah. They can say, I like you very much. I like you very much when I am off. <laughs> like, you know, I don't know, like you just can't handle like two sentences that are too big. Mm -hmm. uh, the first dialogue that I use in the textbook, it's, I think it's like five seconds or six seconds. And it's just an introduction. And I can show to you, I can share the screen and show, but it, the person is just saying, instead of saying, how are you? He just says, is everything all right? You know, tudo certo. And the other person says, tudo certo, like all all right. And that's it. <laughs> that was the dialogue. And then I realized I had somebody pointing out to me that Brazilians don't say, I am meu nome é, we say my name is, we just a lot of the times just say our name. So if I'm meeting Simone, I say, Oi Simone, Eduardo, prazer. So I just say, my name, Eduardo, pleasure meeting you. So I'm not saying my name is Eduardo, but the textbooks always will have my name is, right? So it becomes very, as you said, mechanical, not natural. Um, let me screen, do the share screen. Do we have time for this? I think so, right? Okay. If the video, if you are lucky, the video is gonna work out well. And here's your email, Angelica. Um, but this is the textbook that I, will, I mentioned to you before from University of Wisconsin, Portuguese para principiantes, that's the grammar textbook. So the very first unit from the textbook I wrote, you know, I put here 
by the end of this lesson, be able to greet people, that's one. So the greeting part is here. Let's see if it's gonna work. E aí, sim. Oi, Felipe, tudo bem? Tudo certo, e você? Tudo certo também. So when he says, e aí, Cynthia, it's like, what's up, Cynthia? Oi, Felipe, tudo bem? All good? Tudo certo. Tudo certo também. All good too. That's it. But the dialogue is like eight seconds, right? It is fast. Oi, Felipe, tudo bem? Tudo certo, você? Tudo certo também. Oh, I didn't want to do again. But yeah, just... Just an example, eight seconds of an introduction. I thought it was perfect, actually. When I saw it, it's like, oh, wow. I don't talk like this. I don't say tudo certo. But then after I was traveling in Brazil, went to my family's uh, house, I just heard everybody saying tudo certo. <laughs> I was like, oh, wow, everybody says tudo certo now. Because in my mind, I didn't hear before because I don't say it. Right? I wasn't paying attention. You don't say to do joya. I say to do joya. I, I always tell my students, hi, to do joya. Right? And then people in Brazil say, like, I got feedback from people there saying, no, don't say joya. It's too old fashioned. And I'm like, really? That's what so mean? Like, funny. It's so joya. In Southern and then, Brazil, everyone says it. And then I realized that depending on the parts of the country, yeah. younger people say it, other parts of the country, no, they don't. So, you know, I have the TAs here about this specific word. They're like, oh, yeah, my grandma says it. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's nice. You just, you know, compare myself with your grandma. Like, that's my language <laughs> register, right? But then I realized it depends on the region, too. Yeah. But to do certo, it's like very university. It goes well with our language, our students, right? Because they are at the university level. So, um, the age group is the same. Are there other questions? I think we have time for one more question. Lisa has the hands up. Yeah, Lisa, go ahead. Hi, Eduardo. Thank you so much. My name is Lisa. I work here at the Language Resource Center. I'm sorry my camera isn't working, but I'm but I'm here. Um, thank you so much for a really interesting talk. I've really in the past had the opportunity to sit in on some Portuguese classes here at Cornell and it's such a beautiful language I just love it I was so surprised at how musical it is and I just love it um, so I was thinking watching the little eight second clip can the students upload their own audio to compare to a model this is how I study Japanese and we did a lot of this we we listened to these little dialogues and um, conversations and then we had to record ourselves and then upload our recordings and compare it to the native speaker. I've done that on Canvas as part of the homework assignments, you know, like, oh, listen to this dialogue and I'll record. Um, and then I got to listen to what they're saying too. Uh, on the textbook itself, I know there are some advances now that, you know, you can do more things. And that was one idea I had in the future to create a third part of the unit when they can do exercises right there, you know, like drag answers. And, but I'm not sure if you can record there. I don't think they have that cap capability on the platform, press books. I might be wrong though, I would have to double check. Oh, but yeah, I like that exercise. I think it's very valid to listen to yourself. It and helps it's me, yeah. It's, it's hard too, like I don't like to listen to myself. I've never listened to this recording. I, know I think it helped me overcome a hurdle, which was to get some longer phrases and chunks, you know, just to get my tongue around some longer forms like the passive and the causative in Japanese that were just really hard to catch, like it, in just regular spoken speech. And it um, also shows your level of proficiency in the language, too. I remember when I was at Brigham Young, they were doing a research where in order to to detect your level of ability in the language, you just look through a dialogue, a sentence on the screen, 
and then the sentence would go out and then you had to repeat what you just saw. So people who could repeat longer sentences, they had a higher level of proficiency and people who could just repeat short sentences, they had a lower level of proficiency. So you did that like in 10 minutes and then you would compare their level of proficiency with this repetition exercise with an OPI exam and they would match and <laughs> be like, yes, this person who could you know, repeat and say this long sentence is an advanced speaker and she or he did the OPI and it was also rated as an advanced speaker. Um, so yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, being mindful of the time here, um, please all help me in thanking Eduardo for joining us today and for giving this, this talk. Um, we'll stick around here for a little while longer. So if you are interested in um, hanging out for a few more minutes and asking him more questions, please do. So Eduardo, thank you again. Thank and you. thanks to everybody for joining us today. Good luck with the rest of the semester here to all of our Cornellians and have a wonderful summer, everybody. Yeah, thank you so much. That was very nice.